Welcome, everybody. Uh, this is a McCloskey speaker series. We welcome our people, uh, the people on Aspen Public Radio, and it's a great pleasure to welcome General Keith Alexander, who was dual-hatted uh, to run the National Security Agency and the U.S. Cyber Command, now runs IronNet, and it's great to have you. Thanks for being here, sir. Honored to be here. Thank you. So you graduated in West Point from, in 1974, and you had, uh, let's see, you had General Petraeus in your class, you had Martin Dempsey, you had Skip Sharp. Um, what was it like to have a class of, that all became four stars? Well, there was 860 in the class, so that was just four. <laughs> But that's a pretty um, and, and if number. you bet on some of us, if you bet on Marty Dempsey, who became the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, and me, you'd say, those guys will never make four stars. <laughs> They're trouble. Um, but was it, Petraeus as intense Petraeus, back then as he, he is was? Now? Yeah, he was. He okay. wanted to, you know, he was, that's, uh, that was he. Uh, Skip Sharp was actually uh, great. And, you know, you'd never guess that Skip, very good. Uh, and we had uh, 22 or so other general officers in the class. So. It was an honor and privilege. You know, this was, it was a great opportunity. Free education, thank you. Um, but no, I, I, the reason I picked that as a particularly interesting time, it was the first class after Vietnam, really. And yet it became a class that really produced some of the great strategic thinkers, yourself included. Was there any particular reason, you thought, or? Yeah, I think the one thing that our class had that no other class had was the superintendent at that time was General Knowlton. Mm -hmm. And he was there for all four years for us. And, you know, he was, and actually interesting, Dave married Holly Knowlton. Mm -hmm. And, but he was there and he was the role model of what officers should be like. And he was exceptional at that. You know, he had the integrity, the humility, everything that you would, that you look at and you say, I want to be like that. And I think for our class, having him there four years and getting to know him, we were blessed. You talk about leadership lessons you learned. What leadership lessons did you learn from, say, working with President George W. Bush? Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I, when I got to NSA, and the ambassador probably knows this, uh, some of these stories, but when I got there, I had no idea you know, as an Army officer coming to NSA that you're going to end up briefing the president. My first day on the job, I come in and they say, you're going to brief the president on a subject you're not cleared for. <laughs> and I thought, this is going to be a short briefing. <laughs> and when do I get cleared? Well, the vice president's got to clear you. I said, hopefully that will happen ahead of time. <laughs> so you end up, I ended up meeting with the president and the National Security Council a lot, 26 times the first six months there, about once a week. And President Bush, uh, in a series of meetings with Secretary Rumsfeld, great stories there, and it, it is, it's kind of humorous if, if you uh, like pain at times. But actually, <laughs> with Secretary Rumsfeld, he was great for me to work with, he really was. And I was sometimes a little bit uh, too, you know, humorous, and I shouldn't toy with the Secretary. Uh, but. We were responsible for coming up with this uh, new collection capability for our country. And I briefed the president, and, and he came out to, to Fort Meade uh, in the, uh, about a year after all this was going on. He goes, he comes in, and now we live on this house, and in front of us is this parade field. And so my wife is going to see the president come in, the helicopters are going to come in, and they say, the limos will come in. So the limos come up ahead of time. And they'll say, well, I ask, do I just ride in my vehicle? They say, well, when the president gets off, he'll tell you where you're going to ride. Mm -hmm. If you're going to ride with him, he'll tell you. Otherwise, you get back in your vehicle. So <laughs> we get there, and uh, the helicopters land, and I go up and say, welcome to Fort Meade, Mr. President. And he goes, General, get in the car. We got to talk. Just like that. Mm -hmm. uh, so he goes, General, there's two issues. Uh, and, oh, by the way. We're the only two in the vehicle. He's in the jump seat, I'm in his seat. And I'm thinking, man, this is really cool. He, right? <laughs> it's too bad we couldn't get pictures. Yeah. And so he goes, General, two issues we gotta talk about. First issue, you got too many bosses. We're gonna fix that right now. 
And I thought, ooh, danger, Will Robinson. Yeah. My, my bosses are the president, him, the vice president, Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld, it's uh, Under Secretary of Defense Gambone, it's uh, Negroponte, it's the chairman, and it's the commander of STRATCOM. Who are you gonna throw under the bus and yeah. live? <laughs> so I wisely said to the president, I like all my bosses, they're good to me. And actually they were, they actually work with me. And he goes, General, one other issue. This terror surveillance program, this terror stuff, it's gonna get really bad. It had leaked to the press. It's gonna be really bad. Here's the deal. You defend the country, I'll take the heat. And he did, every step of the way. It was the greatest act of leadership I saw in my time there. And so he came out to Fort Meade and told your people, too, that I've got your back on the, FI the FISA, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Oh. What about Obama? Did he have that same feel for supporting this, or was he so, more conflicted? Well, I think it was, it's a different, a different approach. In the National Security Council meetings, and Matt said in a lot of these with us, we were kind of... Uh, cohorts there, um, their decision process was about the same on defending the nation, doing A or B. But the difference in, I think, in my experience is Obama was a brilliant constitutional lawyer. Is that a compliment or an insult? Yes. And, <laughs> and the, uh, and he, had, he was used to dealing with legal issues, but not leading a large organization. And Bush was used to leading a large organization and taking accountability for it. And so there was a difference in the way. So Obama would look to his political advisors of what should we do on this? And oftentimes they gave him the right political advice, not the best leadership advice. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in, in retrospect, in a couple of issues that we actually said, and you could see he was, he had learned over time, yeah, I spent, I got 15 minutes to feel good, and we should have did this. And I think, had he had been a governor or something like that, he would have been a great president. Mm -hmm. And when it came to leaders, you worked, I saw you last night with Stan McChrystal, General McChrystal, and he wrote a book called Team of Teams, and you were kind of a part of that, because you went to Iraq, and you all worked in a collegial, collaborative way. What was he like as a leader, and how did you all work together? So, it's interesting. Um, I knew Stan for quite a while. We sat on boards together, um, and he ran Joint Special Ops Command when I went to Iraq the first time, and this, this was in, well, I've been a number of times, but we were now, um, the number of casualties we were taking, and the ambassador knows part of the story, was huge, it was growing significantly. We were taking losses, it looked like we were starting to lose, and uh, I went over to see how our intelligence was being handled, and I went to folks like Stan and Dave Petraeus, and I said, so what do you, what do you think? And uh, they said, well, human intelligence is really good, and I thought, well, all these, every bad guy's got a cell phone, everybody, got, why isn't it SIGINT? Well, your stuff takes too long to get here. And, they, and uh, so we went through and tracked all that and found out, yeah, we had a process where we would take our intel, bring it back to Fort Meade, make sure it was exactly right, and send it back to the warfighter. So when you stand with, uh, sit down with Stan, they say, well, no, what we're really trying to do, we don't care what they say, we know who the bad guy is, just tell us where he is. And so we created a system called the Real-Time Regional Gateway. We brought it into Iraq and we brought all the data, and it, what used to take us 16 hours, we got down to one minute. And what Stan and Dave and others were able to do over that next year with that system is take down 3,950 bad guys. And the interesting part was Stan, who was great. You know, Joint Special Ops Command, they're tracking Al-Qaeda and the best, and we say, well, we need your data. And he said, well, I'm not sure we can share that with you. And I thought, well, we're an SA. I mean, probably get it myself, but we should work together. And he says, yeah. And so I had a, a really brilliant female lieutenant colonel, Jenny Easterly, Rhodes Scholar, one of the best officers in the, in the world. And so I said, well, give me a few of the bad guys that you're trying to track. Da, 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 da. And so Jen's putting it all in. And I said, would you like to know where they are right now? She turned the screen around, and there they were. 
And in the, that one minute, Stan said, you can have our data. We're good. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you, we, went, uh, we would go to his op center at night. This guy, uh, Stan McChrystal, was the best operator that I saw. We'd sit there at night and go through all the operations, and they'd go from one thing, collect the phone, go after the next guy, come in, collect the next. It was like clockwork, and he was amazing. A true hero for our country. What he did and the amount of time he spent there was absolutely amazing. Tell him you said so. Thank yeah. you. Well, that's because, you know, he could hurt me, and if I didn't say <laughs> that. You know, you spoke of uh, FISA and the hoovering or the gathering of large amounts of data that was done. I think it's 702 is the part of the law that allows you to take metadata. Explain to me the data you actually collected and what data did you collect on U.S. citizens? So this is, uh, it's interesting and it, some of the most humorous, and I gave you some of the humorous stories about talking to people and uh, having members of Congress say, can you show me the file on me? We don't have a file. You know, I'd like to see my file. We don't have a file. There is no file on you. I want to see my file. This, true story, this went back and forth like five times. And you know, I thought, this is right out of Cheech and Chong. We don't keep files on US people. Here's how it works. So let me explain what the metadata program is. If you go back to 9-11, the issue with the terrorists that were in California is NSA could intercept communications overseas and see these terrorists talking about an event. And we didn't know that it was into the US because of the way the communications were intercepted. And so you had no way of knowing, is this guy talking to somebody in the US? Had we have known that, we could have stopped 9-11. And that was called connecting the dots. Now, how do you connect the dots? And so the thesis of connecting the dots was, you can get the billing records, which the courts agreed, if we did this right, were, uh, complied, comported with the Fourth Amendment, and what it would do is you take all the billing records, think of this as long distance communications data that's collected by your telcos, and put it into a repository. And then when you had a terrorist communication come into the company, uh, country, now it's only to, from, number, date, time, group, and duration of the call. No name, so NSA doesn't know whose phone it is, it's no content, it's just four numbers. And you know, and, and again, this is right out, just, just four numbers, and somebody say, well, you're listening to my call. There's no data, four numbers. And what, and I'll give you a real world story how this actually came into play, if I could. Because <clears throat> with this data, um, and if I can, I'm gonna match that with 702, because this is a good story that I think will give you some insights about what our nation is trying to do. So they put all this data into a database. NSA has to prove that a number that it's got from overseas, trying to call into the US, that that number is associated with Al Qaeda or related terrorist group. Once they have that, the court authorizes NSA to look into that metadata repository and see who it's talking to and how many hops. And you can go out, uh, it was at that time three hops, and I think now it's two, but it's two or three hops today. And what that means is you can see I'm talking to Matt, Matt's talking to the ambassador, and the ambassador may be talking to Walter. And so what you can see is the link, and, and that's important because is any of those link back to terrorists. So the real world proof of this happened in 2009. Um, uh, under a similar program, the FISA 702, which allows NSA to gather information overseas of a terrorist communicating into the US the content of an email of that terrorist. And NSA was tracking some guys in Pakistan who were talking to somebody in the US, and with that authority, we could get the content of that message, that, that email that he was sending. And they they a foreigner. This is an Al Qaeda known yeah, so terrorist. No U.S. citizen. No, it's this guy communicating with somebody in the U.S. We don't right. know who it is, and he's talking about building bombs and conducting an attack. Almost that plain. And he had a phone number in there. So NSA is authorized to get that communication, and the job of NSA was to solve the problem that we had for 9/11. We get that information, see it's terrorist related. 
Our job is to hand it off to FBI. And now FBI goes through all their procedures to do the rest of it. In uh, September 6, 2009, a terrorist, Al-Qaeda, was, uh, was communicating with somebody and it was believed to be in the Denver area, so we got that email communication and we saw, yep, they're talking about building a bombs. They have a phone number. We gave it to the FBI, 6 September. The FBI goes and w issues a national security letter. They go get whose email is he talking to in Denver. And so now the FBI can go through their process to figure out who it is. And they found it was a guy named Najibul Azazi. Now Najibul Azazi, they also said that number is Najibul Azazi's number. Now they came back to us on two th uh, September 9th or 10th, late 9th, early morning 10th, and they said that number is his. So now NSA can look into that metadata repository and say who was Zazi we know he's now linked to an Al-Qaeda. Who is he communicating with? In the first hop out, we see several people in the Indiana, uh, New York City, and then the next hop out, several others. In the third hop out, we saw some known terrorists overseas communicating and led back to, sorry, the person in New York City. And so we were able to tell the FBI, that guy in New York City is of specific interest. And so the FBI, saw that, and that was about uh, the 11th. On about the 12th, Zazi starts driving across the U.S. And Zazi, on the 14th, the FBI con was concerned that the attack was imminent. They raided the person in New York City. And they found in his apartment seven backpacks in various states of readiness. These two guys were going to go and bomb the New York City subway. That's the New York City subway plot. Okay, it was stopped by 702 and this metadata FISA program. So, wait, 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 let me interrupt real quick. 702 is about to expire, and even the Republicans in Congress are not planning to renew it. They have now revolted against it. Why? Well, I, th I think, you know, this is the how toxic the two party system is in Washington, but from my perspective, this is the most important counterterrorism program we have. We need to get that reauthorized. And the reality is, this is tracking bad guys' communications. It, has Trump asked for it to be reauthorized? Yeah, I think, I think the administration's working hard. In fact, I think a number of people uh, here in the audience are pushing it. I know Matt and I are pushing it. And, you know, having seen it, you know, I have 16 grandchildren. I want them to lead a full life. We need to protect our country from these folks. And this is a great program. Um, and, and so why did it get so controversial? Was it the Snowden leaks that caused people to feel that this program meant you were spying on Americans? Well, I think that's the misinterpretation. And if, if I could, that kind of gets into um, a story here on how things can get so misinterpreted. People say, well, NSA is listening to my phone calls. You're reading my emails. Actually. We're not, they're not. And the reason is they're really busy. They're going after bad guys. And if you're talking to an Al-Qaeda terrorist or your neighbor is, you probably want somebody to look at that and say, what's up with that? Why would somebody be talking to an Al-Qaeda person in Pakistan? That's what we couldn't do to stop 9-11 and we should do today. Now you have the courts involved, so it's overseen by the courts by the administration, by Congress. This is not a program that NSA is just out there winging it. You have all this oversight. And it's interesting, when the Snowden leaks came out, President Obama said, we need a review group. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> it's interesting, and this is all true story, so you gotta have a sense of humor. Now, I've been in the job for eight years, and uh, I'm thinking a review group. Well, you authorize this program. You know you authorize, but we can do a review group. And it'll show that we're really good looking and we did this right. Um, one of those two will be true. Uh, so I, I get called down to the White House. Um, and you know it's not good when you come down to the White House and you go into the sit room and they're all sitting on one side of the table and you're on the other. <laughs> but this is odd. I, I actually showered. Why would they be sitting there and, and the National Security Advisor, she says, 
Um, we're going to have a review group. And I said, I know. I have some great names. We could get Condoleezza Rice. We can get Colin Powell. We can get all these luminaries. And they will tell the American people what we're doing. Let's, let's just tell them. And they go, well, actually, we've already decided. And I said, but I have some great ideas. And they said, we, the president has made a decision. So being a good soldier, I said, okay. So they slide these five folders with their fingertips and pull their hand back. I think they thought, crazy army guy could hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> so this is I, Susan Rice this, we're talking about? Yeah, well, could be. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so, and, uh, so I open up the first file folder, and I'll, I'll kind of tamper down what I really said. Um, I, I read it. It's yada, 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 board member of the ACLU. And I said, you've got to be kidding me. Yep. And... Uh, this guy's suing us, and you're going to have him come in and do a review group? I said, the president has decided. So I said, okay. So I go back up to NSA, and a couple of days later, this review group comes up there. And about, so we have big tables. The ambassador knows this for our, actually, our advisory board. And uh, the guy from the ACLU is sitting about as far back as you are with the green shirt with his arms crossed like this, and he's sitting there, and he looked at me like, Luke, I ate your father. And, 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 I, and I looked at him somewhat askance, and I thought, wow. Um, but I figured, okay, I'm going to tell him the program. We're going to do 100% audit. You get to see everything. We had myself, Chris Inglis, and we for about 90 minutes went in there. And then we said, look, here's the deal. Here's the young folks who run this program. Any question you have, they will do a 100% audit with you on everything that you did so you can see that we're doing this right and it's good for the country. Five weeks later, I come back in. Now the guy's sitting there. He gets up when I come in the room and I think, he's gonna attack me. <laughs> now my, eat, my protection unit's not there, but I'm in pretty good shape. I think I can take him. He comes around the table and you know how guy, some people shake your hand that your whole body's moving? He's, shaking my hand like this, and he goes, you and your people have the greatest integrity of any agency Bravo. in government. And I said, well, don't tell me. Tell the president, <laughs> tell Congress, tell the American people, and tell the people of NSA. And he said, I'll do that. And so he actually wrote out a series of articles on this that, that actually said that, that you know, what NSA is doing abides with the law, is the right thing, yeah. And he actually, after I got out, when this program was going to be re, it was coming up for reauthorization, he said, would you write an op-ed with me to get this reauthorized? And I said, well, I thought you didn't like the program. He said, I don't like the program. But we need to give our counterterrorism people something to defend this country. And this is the best thing that we have. And if we get attacked again, we won't have civil liberties and privacy. That individual's name is Jeffrey Stone. Right. He was the acting dean at the University of Chicago Law School. Uh, he was a board member of the ACLU. He was also of their advisory board and of the, on the presidential review group. And uh, he was one of the instructors for Obama. Mm -hmm. and, and he so, wrote a report that actually totally vindicated yep. and, and so praised what the NSA did, so which didn't get enough publicity. That's right. So, you know, you don't want, that doesn't sell news that uh, government spy agencies actually doing what we asked them to do and they're defending you and helping to protect you. Um, we'd rather think of these guys as listening to your phone calls and reading your emails. And <laughs> But the practical reality is he saw that they were doing it exactly right. So that gets us back to how do you tell that story? and. Uh, He's been, he's been actually, think about this, an Army officer and a board member of the ACLU get together to write an op-ed for the good of our nation, for the good of what our country needs. And that's what we need in Congress and elsewhere, people working together for the country, not for politics. Bravo. Amen. Amen. And it's somewhat astounding now that um, Congress just can't, do anything by the end of the year, so pro probably. I mean, what, what causes this? Is this some knee-jerk? It's not just partisanship, because it's, it's been Republicans yeah. and Democrats now. 
Well, I, I think part of it is that they don't take the time to really understand or read through. And I think this is where folks like Jeffrey Stone and others, and probably, I guess we'll probably do another op-ed and, and with him, uh, because this program is critical to defending our country in terrorism. Of the 50-some terrorist uh, things that we released, that program was key in 53 of the 54 or something like that, all but one. You don't have that program, we got a problem. And I'll tell you that, you know, the most important thing is stop a terrorist attack before it happens. That takes intelligence and people working hard. And, you know, these are good people. These are great people that are working for our country. You know, Matt ran the National Counterterrorism Center, um, great American. You've got all the young people working in the agencies and providing the intel to do that. This is what our nation needs. And I think we've got to stop the sensationalizing and inflaming. We've got to support people like that. You know, it's soldiers, sailors, airmen, marine, and civilians that are doing this. Uh, speaking of which, I was at the NSA at Fort Meade at one point, and you're absolutely right. The, the young techies who are working there just, and they tend to be from good places, like, you know, Texas Tech or whatever. But, no, I say this. My son-in-law is Texas Tech. Right. No, no, I, the guy I talked to was there from it. But he said, yeah, I'm doing this because I'm serving my country. But the, his commander said, we can't recruit people. We can't, you know, this kid is great. But if we go to Harvard or Stanford or Berkeley, you know, they're all going to Google. Are you having trouble getting people at the NSA, the best engineers? Is there some patriotism card you could play and say, we need you? So in my time there, so I can talk to that, for 2,000 uh, jobs, we had over 20,000 applications. Um, the issue that I see that you bring up that I'm concerned about is we don't pay them enough. And you know the way they're treated in the press, it doesn't make them feel good about this because they have to defend it with not just their, their spouses and their family, but their extended family. And everybody goes, why are you listening to us? We're not listening to you. Oh, I know you're listening to us. It was in the paper. Well, that's not true. And so you go through all this, and I think NSA is bleeding talent for a, a number of reasons. And this it hurts our country. So it's pay and prestige. It's, it's pay, it's pay or whatever plus, you call it. And, and all the things that go with it. And, you know, remember, NSA was started on the foundation of World War II in Enigma. It was, think about what the greatest generation did to protect this country. And NSA was born out of that same spirit. Now, going back to Enigma, some of those people, Alan Turing or whatever, one of the complaints I heard, this is a Colorado question, if you don't mind, mm -hmm. is if you've ever smoked dope, you can't become part of the NSA. Shouldn't you change some of those rules? <laughs> Next question. <laughs> okay. Uh, no. I, I, I actually, yeah, I, I actually agree with you on that. I think, you know, and actually, I think it's not a question of, did you smoke pot once or did you do something like that? I think it's actually more about how much drug, it, you know, I mean, so, mm -hmm. you know, three times a week for six years and a few other things. So I, yeah, I've, I've seen, and I actually talked to our security guys on just that question. So what happens, we get this bright kid who made a stupid mistake, what do you do? And the answer is there's gotta be a way to capture that. And, and I think that's true. Yeah. Um, when also, one thing that struck me when I was there is you have the NSA in Fort Meade, a room almost this size. It looks like a movie set. I mean, that, you know, different rooms. And then it's right next to Cyber Command, also in the same building, right? Fort Meade, if I remember, same. And you became the head of the NSA and the head of Cyber Command. You were dual hatted. Cyber Command is the U.S military command that fights cyber wars. And there was a wonderful cooperation when the NSA would get something they needed, they'd go, Cyber Command could do something on offense if was necessary, or at least on defense. And now you have the government, or the civilian part of the government, 
uh, from Obama and even I think it's official policy now, they want to split off Cyber Command from the National Security Agency. I know you had to support that when you were in office. Do you actually still support it? Well, I, uh, in office we supported keeping them together because while I was there, there was no talk about uh, putting them apart. I think the issue that really comes into and has to be looked at is how do we operate in cyberspace? And when you think about operating in cyberspace, you know, we don't want this to be a domain of warfare, but the reality is we don't get to make that call. The adversary does, and they're using cyber as an element of national power. And so now the, this question is, we will be attacked in cyber by nation states and by others. How are we going to defend it, and how is our government organized to do it? So I think our first question is you have to walk through that. If you think about what the greatest generation and their parents went through, it was how do we create the Air Force? What do we do with all, all these different things? What about the aircraft carrier now becoming a platform from reconnaissance to an attack? All these things changed. And what we're seeing in cyber is that level of change. Cyber is being used as an element of national power, the attacks on Ukraine, the attack on Sony, the attack on other individuals. When you look at that, it's increasing. You see what, how this whole domain is changing almost overnight. Everybody here has got a cell phone. You've got cameras in your house. You've got all these things that are now connected to the web. You've got smart TVs and some dumb TVs. You've got a smart refrigerator. Um, and that rats you out if you eat too much. I gotta talk to my wife. And all these things, um, we're at risk. But do we and have even a protocol? You just mentioned the cyber attack on Sony. If they had, if the North Koreans had sent a missile and hit Sony, there would have been a protocol that said, boom, here's what we do. We didn't know what to do, it seemed. Right, so I think it, it, it's two sets of views. Whose job is it to defend uh, industry? And one is industry should do that, and the other is government has a responsibility. And if you ask, so I asked actually at DEF CON, Black Hat, and RSA that question. I said, how many believe it's government's job? How many believe it's industry's job? How many agree it's both? And you get everybody to agree it's both, right? And so what you, what you get to is, so how's that going to work? And let's talk about Sony, because I think this is a great example. Um, if, so, if a nation state were to throw a missile into Sony, it would be Northern Command's responsibility to stop that missile because Northern Command would see the missile coming in. NORAD would see it. They would work and they would shoot down that missile, hopefully. Okay, so that's a military response. In cyber, the issue is how do you create the rules of engagement that go at network speed? Remember, shooting down a missile, you got 25, 30 minutes, you can go out and get an espresso. You can say, where's the missile? When are we gonna interdict it? We've got a couple tries at this. How's it going? And you know, you're coming back and forth. You maybe do a couple emails, you come back and check it out. In cyber, it can go around the world 134 milliseconds. That's time for one espresso. It's a very quick espresso, but that's about it. And so the rules of engagement have to go with the people who are defending it. And Oh, they have to see it. And right now, industry can't uh, show the government what's attacking them. So if you take this Sony, when Sony's being attacked, Sony doesn't know it's being attacked. It's being attacked by a nation state. And by the time Sony understands it, it's all over. So our approach to defending our country in cyberspace is not where it needs to be. It's broken. And specifically, let's now change that whole framework and say, for a company or a set of companies and sectors, what if they were able to push up data, think of it as dialing 911, but at network speed when they're being attacked. And that has to go to the right government agencies, in this case, the Defense Department, in my opinion. And the Defense Department should have a set of rules of engagement. They see it's coming from North Korea, and they know what then to do to stop it and it should be practiced and rehearsed. Now, we have a long ways to go to get there, but technically, 
That's what needs to be well, done. We have to get our head there because you're saying, if I'm interpreting you correctly, it should be primarily the government's job to stop an attack, whether it's cyber or missile, on the United States. By but we haven't States. even made that decision yet, have we? I just did. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> I thought we were good on that. Okay, I thought we were already done. I thought we were good. We already moved on. Yeah, okay. The government, don't, don't it, slow but down. it should be the government. I think it should be. And okay. I think, actually, uh, you know, this was part of the meeting that we had with the president. So you met with the president a few weeks ago, both on the electricity grid and this. What did you tell him about the government's role in protecting critical infrastructure? Well, I think it went along with this line, and we actually had the energy sector briefing it. Uh, and I was there uh, to, exp to talk about the cyber portion and Mayor Giuliani. Um, first, because uh, I, well, I, we can come back on the president himself on a couple things, but the issue was, the energy sector, if they're attacked, how do we see it? And so several of the energy companies are working with us to now create what we'll call an iron dome. So think of this as these big companies, they're going to all kind of instrument their network so that when they're being attacked, it can be visible and you can see what's attacking our energy sector. Now some of that's, you know, criminal, okay, you can go handle that. Some of that's this but you would be able to see it with the intent, if you can see it amongst the companies in the energy sector, they can share it with the government at the same speed. A comprehensive cybersecurity solution that allows the sector and the government to work together for a comprehensive common defense. That's what we talk about in our constitution, for the common defense. It didn't say in there, for the common defense, unless it's hard, or in cyberspace, and then you're on your own. It says for the common defense. And in the that commission- That should be a role of cyber command, you think? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, and you've got cyber command, you've got NSA, you've got DHS, everybody's got roles and responsibilities. But that's why I'm asking, it should be in the Defense Department as a command of the U.S. military. Yeah, I, so there's actually two sets of roles for defending in the counterattack. The only ones that can counterattack are cyber command. And NSA can provide the recon and perhaps some of the covert, if it's decided to go that way, capabilities. DHS would have the responsibility to help the sector, if you're being attacked, to, to remain operational. And so Cyber Command has cyber protection teams send them or help them virtually help keep that sector up. And so you'd want to have both of those working together, and we should practice that. And that's what we talked with the president. And I'll tell you, um, you know, we we're, we were talking about the president. Let me give you my views of him. And I don't have the hair, <laughs> and I don't Twitter. But other than that, um, it's interesting, because I've met with the president twice on cybersecurity. And in these meetings, uh, what I found is it was a small group. We had about 12 or 15 people in the room all around the table. And I sat diagonal across from the president. and he had read all the stuff on what we we're gonna talk about. He knew all the key issues. He knew who the key people were in the room. He asked great questions and he got to the bottom line, what do I need to do? What help do you need and how do we do this? And we talked about the roles and responsibilities, what we needed to do. And it was actually my thought, and I, on the first time out when I came out, I told the press, that's the president the American people need to see. Because it's not the one that's characterized in the, in the papers. What's characterized is some guy who's over here and you have all this hair and, and you got Twitter. What I saw was a person with CEO experience asking all the right questions and saying, we need to protect this country in cyberspace. How do we do it? Let's get it done. And has he moved, <laughs> bravo. Has he moved further down the road then in thinking what is the lead uh, agency or uh, military command that should take charge so that we don't have this weird process where for six months people are saying, yes, Sony got attacked, but we don't know. Maybe it's the Justice Department. Maybe it's the Deputy Attorney General for National Security. Uh, have, in other words, are we getting closer to having the proper <coughs> rules of engagement? So my recommendation to the President and um, I know both Secretary Jim Mattis and Secretary John Kelly. These are great guys. I, I served with them. They're Marines. <laughs> I know, but that's all. 
But By actually, way, my father was a Marine, so let's, let's just be clear. Uh, Marines, and they were really good to work with. And my comment to the president is, look, these two know what they're doing. They're not going to fight over who's doing A to B. They're going to do this right for the country. Let those two come up with a division of effort. And I would tell you it's essentially what we just talked about. Cyber Command has the only offensive force. There is no shooters in DHS, period. So if you want to stop somebody from attacking you, DHS can do incident response. That's what the executive order. That means National Transportation Safety Board clean up after the plane crashes. It doesn't stop it. We want to stop this from happening. And where DHS would do is set standards and do things. So I, I think those two individuals, they're great people. They will do this right. There is no, um, you know, this is my turf or any of that. They will do what's good for this country. You were meeting in this building a few hours ago with uh, Secretary Kelly, the Secretary of Homeland Security, as part of our, something you helped uh, us stand up, which is our, um, our Homeland Security uh, group with Clark Irvin. How did you all, at that meeting, you all were trying to figure out how do you allocate responsibilities without violating whatever the rules are you have at that meeting? What were Secretary Kelly and you working on? I, I, well, and I've had some discussions with them, and bottom line is uh, it just goes right, it reinforces what I, what I just said. Secretary John Kelly is a really good person. His comment is, okay, how do we do this? What's the right thing to do? How do we work together? You know, what we want, what you want, is these government agencies and departments to work together as a team to defend this country. You don't want them fighting over, oh, it's my job or it's my job or it's my job. It's how do we do it? And what I like about both Mattis and Kelly, they're gonna say, how do we do it? And then whose job is that to do it? And how do we train to get people to do it, period. And, and I think what you'll come to is that, well, the only ones with offensive force, Cyber Command, the only ones who can see globally, NSA, and the only ones that you want working with industry to help reinforce it, DHS, so you, you already so you would got keep the rules. Cyber Command and NSA as one dual-hatted agency, but you'd let DHS sort of be like the FBI is the CIA, keep it separate. Well, now, now you're into, uh, let's go back uh, nine years when Secretary Gates and we were talking about this. I really believe in a couple of the principles, unity of effort, unity of command and control. And I think at some point you gotta have somebody in charge. And how do you do that? Who's in charge? Uh, Secretary Gates was great at this. Um, you know, he really was. He was phenomenal to work with. Uh, and his comment was, we need to get all that under one individual. Okay. So that when the attack comes, you have one person doing it. Because that's, you can't, yeah, you can't you try to say, well, I want A, I want B. I want A, I want B. Now we have to go to the president because we disagree and we've got to get it fixed. Actually, you need somebody who's doing it. And remember, this is being executed at network speed. And so the decisions are, you know, I actually had, I, this was you, you're great. So they said, well, we want to kind of do this. And so what we're going to do is we're going to have an attack come on the company. This was about eight years ago. And they said, what we're going to do is we'll have an attack come in. We want you to create a briefing. The next day you'll give the briefing and the next day we'll make a decision. And I said, you realize that the time the attack occurred and the time it's all done is about three seconds. There's no need for a briefing. All you need now is who's going to clean up. Um, and so you we mentioned, need to think like that. Yeah. You've mentioned three times, so I'm going to pick up on it, uh, the offensive capability of cyber command as being an important aspect of this. Um, since you're no longer running it, perhaps you can answer this question. If the phone rang and it was a president and he said, I want no electricity in North Korea for a week, is that something we have the offensive capability to do? And do we have the rules of engagement to decide whether we should do it? All right, sorry. Well, look at the time. We got to go. <laughs> okay, so speaking in general terms, uh, first, not that I was a general, but in general terms, um, it's, you know, what we saw is if you could imagine it, you can do it. You know, the brilliance of the people that we had at NSA were, were amazing. So if you, could, if you could actually think it, you could do it. Now, what you get into in the, in the question that you just asked is, so what's the, what's the purpose, the intent, and how are you doing it? We, we already said that 
Cyber is an element of national power. That means, think of that as we could do some kind of barricade around North Korea, we can do sanctions, we can do uh, some limited military all the way up to, you know, full war. We could have uh, ambassadors write bad things to them. So you have this whole spectrum. And so what the president and the National Security Council do is they say, how do we achieve the objectives we need with the least amount of impact in terms of casualties and everything? How do we achieve those objectives? And if it's cyber, then Cyber Command would be given the responsibility to go do A, or a combination of Cyber Command and the intelligence community if it's covert. And so what you have is this kind of uh, approach of how you put together a national set of objectives to accomplish a goal for a country. I, I believe that we're going to see cyber used against our country as we're seeing in Ukraine, as we're seeing against Saudi Arabia and Bahrain, and so it's growing. That threat is growing. And those that wish us harm will use it against us, and we need to be prepared for it. The reason that you need offensive is to stop the attack and keep the sector alive. And so you're going to need some kind of uh, cyber capability. But I believe, okay, okay. I was going to say, I yeah. believe what the guidance to me at the time would have been, use the least... Uh, the least capability, you know, harmful capability that you can to achieve your objectives. If you can just turn off the computer or you just stop the flow, do what's, what's least. It's not to inflict, your job is to keep the country intact and then if there's more warranted, and this was in the 2009 objectives, what they said is the president and the secretary would look at the entire spectrum of military power at, at their disposal and determine what to do. But your job, Keep us, keep us operating. When the Aspen Strategy Group 40, 45 years ago here created the doctrine of how to retaliate on nuclear war and people were doing it, the difference it seems to me, or at least Joe Nye, and Scowcroft tell me the difference facing you versus them, is that for them it was somewhat symmetrical. If we had an offensive capability to nuke the Soviets, they wouldn't nuke us. It's asymmetrical here. Our electricity grid is both more vulnerable and 10,000 times more important than North Korea's. So mutual assured destruction is not a good doctrine. That's right. And so uh, that's, a, that's a great point in that it's both there and non-state actors can have state-like effects. And so what you get to is so create a defensive framework. And just to give you an idea of what I mean by a defensive framework, and you know, there's 3,300 uh, energy companies in the U.S. that really 3,300. And if you think of each one of those as each one of you are one of those companies, and if you're being probed or attacked, and we could share it across it, the fabric and what we learn across all of you is 3,300 times what we learn from one of you. And by the neighborhood watch-like program, we're better defended. So. Take that step. I mean, if you can show what's coming at you, then the nation can look at what to do to keep this going. Same for finance, same for uh, health care, same for potentially transportation. Think of cars coming in, I was asking them, so autonomous vehicles and things. So we've got to get this right, and it is coming. And you know, most people say, well, what if we go to an analog system? You know, we're not going back to the Stone Age because this is dangerous. We can solve this problem. And the reality is we haven't sat down and thought, how do we work together to do this for the common good? Instead, we're, we're fighting over politics versus how we defend this country. Mm -hmm. And this is an area that my technical expertise says we can do this. We can do it, and we should do it. We should quit talking about it, just go do it. Now, would it help to do it if we went, rewound the tape back to when the Defense Department invented the Internet and had encoded into the Internet that you have no culpability if you're sending out packets because nobody knows where they come from? And is it now getting to the point where in order to do that big defense you're talking about, we need to change 
either the protocols of the network or the secure socket layers of the network so that anonymity is no longer enshrined in the net? Well, I think there are things like that and other things we have to address. We need to, to put that out there. I would tell you, though, there are things that we can do that are easier than that. I think we should look at all those options, so don't get me wrong. And I think the big ideas, and look, we're the country that, as you said, we, we created the internet. We're the, we're the people who did it. We ought to be the first to defend it. And I think it's defensible. And I think there are things that we can add to make it, as you just said. There are things that we can add to improve it, and we should do that. You know, um, this is the future. You know, uh, just a, another story, if I could. I was on the stage with uh, IBM's John Kelly. Uh, IBM created Watson. Watson is that computer that uh, beat the best humans in jeopardy, right? Remember that? Well, so that's a great story, but the real story was uh, in 2014, we were on the stage, and they said, so here's what we're doing with Watson today. If you're diagnosed with brain cancer uh, a year ago, 2013, five doctors would look at your chart, look at the right, and come up with over 30 days to write chemotherapy and radiation treatment. Brain cancer, you have 14 plus or minus two months to live. This is time is of the essence. And what the compute power, we're having people do this. They took Watson and applied it to it. Instead of taking 30 days, they got it down to nine minutes. So this capability that we have will help us solve Alzheimer's, cancer, and all these things. And you can see it coming, the internet is huge for us. This computational power will be, for our children and our grandchildren, one of the greatest things. We got to defend it. And we can't go back. We have to move forward because, you know, you look at people who are suffering, you know, wouldn't it be great to come up with these? We should, we have to do that. Let me open it up because that was pretty awesome and that took up far too much of your time because I was so fascinated. Way in the back. Hand up, uh, microphone will get to you. I wanted to ask you, all of the things that you've discussed are things that we are using to defend the U.S. with U.S. capability. What, what sort of efforts are there and what kinds of protocols exist, if any, around the world? Is there sort of a law of the sea for uh, cybersecurity and what kind of progress is being made there? Thanks. That's a great question, thanks, because it introduces the, the, how we work with allies. And actually, cyber is a great way to actually evolve our partnership with other countries. And as you look at it, the Middle East, I mentioned this, the Middle East is getting hammered. The Japanese are getting hammered. Europe is getting hammered. What if we work together? Could we create a new kind of standard where we can help defend them and they can help defend us. Because if you think about defending this energy sector here all working together, imagine if we could do the same thing in the Middle East, we could do the same thing in Europe and we could do the same thing in Japan. Now we see attacks on a global scale and with that visibility, we can defend ourselves and our allies better than ever before. And it gets us towards a couple things. You can, you'll, as you think your way through this, you say, okay, some of my friends are friends, some of my friends are frenemies. And so I will want to trust but verify. So almost the sets of things that we went through on, you know, you're, you have certain levels of, of trust and verification, all of that will become true here. And I think absolutely, it's vital. Well, you know, you just talked about having conversations with our allies on this. It would seem that what we did starting maybe in 61, 62, is start having ar nuclear arms talks with the Russians, that that, or our enemies, not our allies. How come there aren't the type of talks that we had for 50 years, SALT talks, START talks, nuclear reduction talks with our enemies? Uh, why don't we have arms reduction talks about cyber? Well, I think we should. I think we should. Uh, I think the issue that you face in cyber, in nuclear weapons, it's pretty cut and dry. You have one or you don't. Mm -hmm. 
and you have this fleet of them and we can see them coming and there are things that we can do. And so you can come up with mutually, mutually assured destruction. In cyber, it is difficult to see and attribute who's doing it. And so those who want to hurt us can say, that's not me. But you should have been able to tell when you were in NSA, was it them or not, right? Right. <laughs> so so, so the questions? issue becomes, if you can tell who it is, how do you tell them that you know it's them in the way that you know it may not be something that you want them to know? You know, this is kind of like, That's well, a really good question, yeah. and can you answer that question? Yeah, uh, so we're really good. <laughs> yes. Uh, and I'll get up to Stefan in a minute. Wait, wait, there's a mic to your right. Yeah. Are you able to comment about defense against electromagnetic pulses? Yes. Um, so if you think about an electromagnetic pulse, um, two parts of this, a missile coming over the U.S. and detonating on a, a nuclear warhead uh, would have devastating impacts on our, uh, all those things that are silicone-based. It would, it would be tremendous damage. Now here's the issue that you have with that. So there's two ways to do this. You could, a nuclear weapon, or somebody puts a nuclear weapon or an EMP device someplace. Both of those are physical instantiations of a threat, which would be a whole lot different than cyber. I actually had a discussion with somebody yesterday on just that issue. My thoughts on this are, if they throw a missile up into outer space to detonate over our country, we're gonna shoot it down before it gets to us, and the perception is somebody tried to detonate a nuclear weapon. We don't know that it's gonna be in space or on the ground. We're just intercepting it, and now you are at a whole different game. The, when I look at the risk in doing that versus the risk of just throwing cyber weapons at us, I think the cyber weapons are much easier to do, and you have all that fuzzy attribution or perception of it, and that's where, that's where I think they will use. I do think EMP is of concern, but I'm orders of magnitude more concerned about cyber. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, back to the beginning of the story here that you told, um, uh, the question has to do with uh, perhaps accountability. Uh, the NSA budget is classified. Do we, is that, am I correct? Yes, um, it is yeah. classified, okay. but I do think they are now releasing portions of that budget uh, for the American uh, people. Until recently, even the existence of NSA was classified, and even admitting that such an organization existed would be revealing classified secrets. You couldn't even talk about NSA. So here we have a huge organization. Uh, we all want to be protected, obviously. But it's a question of accountability. How much is the American people entitled to know as to the cost and the, um, shall we say, the methods that might, uh, uh, and who, who are they accountable to? So accountability, that's a great question. And uh, I felt while I was the director, I was accountable um, for everything we did or failed to do, period. And I think that today, that accountability is more public. So I answered to Congress, the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, and the uh, Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, and to the White House, and to DOD, and to the uh, DNI. So we had all those accountability. What You bring up a, a very good point in that, how did NSA uh, start? Well, it started out of Enigma, and you remember the concern about Enigma was so great that if it was released, we'd lose the war, uh, the, we lose World War II. And it was that important, and the decisions that were made in World War II about Enigma actually lasted until 1974 in terms of how that was dealt. So that was, coming out of World War II, there was so much concern that if we released that, we could lose the next war. And NSA was built with that in mind, and the National Reconnaissance Office very much the same. Having said that, the individuals who operate that and who actually conduct that are held accountable. So if I screwed up you know, for the Snowden thing, I offered my resignation for that, okay? 
Um, they didn't take it, but I did offer that. And I think uh, as an, uh, um, I felt I was accountable and everybody said, well, who should we hold accountable? And I said, me, I'm the director. I'm the one who's responsible, the stops here. So don't think that just because it's classified that we don't hold people accountable. We do. Um, uh, Ambassador to Corlogo, since you got so many shout outs yep. from our, you must have helped him get confirmed or something. I don't know why he's been so nice to you. First of all, uh, let me say I've poking around Washington 50, 60 years. This is one of the best public servants we've had. I mean, he's, 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 he's an, he's an all-star. You brought up Snowden. Has he got anything else? Has he got anything else? Is that, was that your got question? Anything? The question is, uh, Snowden, does he have anything else? Well, we know he had about 1.5 million documents. Um, you know, I'll give you a, a little bit more than you're asking on Snowden, just because I think it's important for all of you to understand. I believe that there was more going on than just Snowden acting by himself. Now, that, uh, it's, there is no proof that Snowden was an agent of a foreign power, but I do believe he was manipulated by a foreign power. And, Russia. Yes, Russia. I'm going to get right to that because, you know, it's interesting. He took 1.5 million documents on thumb drives and he fled to Hong Kong. And what was released in some of the British things, that he was there 10 days before people knew who he was. Remember, he was a contractor, had epilepsy, and was supposedly in medical treatment at that time. And he met for three days in the Russian consulate before ever work, working with the journalists and others. And I, I'm not really great on how to get around the globe, but if I wanted to get to Venezuela the, from Hawaii, it's not through Hong Kong and Moscow. There's a quicker route. I just, just thinking out loud, you go to Mexico City, you're there. Um, so I do believe, as a minimum, he was duped uh, by, um, some of the people on Russia, and if you talk to agents, CIA people that what Russia does, this is right down their lane. So there, the documents, I think, as I understand, the most damning documents have been pushed out, and those that Russia has and others um, really impact our nation. And interestingly, the biggest issue is on our ability to stop terrorists. You know, this is not the program that he released. Remember, he released the fact that we have two programs that he got one of those programs, but he was not read in and did not understand that it was overseen by Congress, of course, and administration, and it was approved by all three. And so he raced off under that and pushed that down. That was a court order that he released from a federal judge telling these carriers to comply with a court order to defend this country. And so, um, my opinion, Snowden has done incredible damage to our country. He should be held accountable. I think he should come back and face a jury of his peers and then face uh, 45 lifetimes in jail or more. The woman there in green, I think. I can't tell with the lighting. I just am curious, um, when you were talking about meeting with the president and you were talking about him being very CEO-like and asking all the correct questions in your, in your experience, how do you reconcile that with the constant drumbeat of asking, of questioning our intelligence services and the information that is being provided? So, so that's a great question. And, and having been in the intelligence community, the only way I can reconcile that is as follows. You know, here's the issue that we want the president and the administration to wrestle with. And that is, what's our relationship with Russia? What's our relationship with China? And how do you go forward on it? Is the best solution, I, and I'm just giving you my thoughts, I'm not, I have no insights and I, I didn't ask him these questions, maybe next time. Uh, but my thought would be, you want the president to stand back 
and you want him to have the ability to come up with the right relationship for our country with Russia. We don't want a war over the Middle East with what's going on in Syria. We don't want a war in Eastern Europe. And we want them to stop their cyber attacks. Um, do we believe that punching them in the eye and saying, yep, we know you got it and we're going to hold you red-handed, and everybody knows it, or do we leave and out? Now, I personally believe everybody knows we know they did it, period. And I think the president knows that, too. The question is, what does he do publicly, and then how does he now work with Putin to get to that right solution? Um, I like, uh, I'm probably more in the Teddy Roosevelt approach. You know, the big stick, give me one of those, we'll go, let's go do it. But then I might get our nation into a place where we didn't want to get to. And, you know, as a CEO, he's used to dealing in areas and ways that we don't, and that may be a good thing for our country. So I think what you bring out is we've got to give the administration the latitude to come up with the right relationship here to protect our country. That's in our best interest. We don't want more wars. Uh, I don't know if we can get there, and I don't know if the tact that he's on is getting him there, but that's the best way I could reconcile it to myself. Last question. Okay, way back. Oh, and you have a microphone already. Oh, no, you have an umbrella. Okay. <laughs> Both useful. Thank you, sir. General Alexander, it's fortuitous that you bring up today uh, the issue of the Sony hack and large manufacturing companies doing things to build into their products the capability to defend against cyber attacks. Uh, today, a company you just mentioned a minute ago was written up in the New York Times as uh, having introduced a product, mainframe computer, that can execute 12 billion instructions, encrypted instructions, a second to do exactly the kinds of things you're talking about. One thing for IBM to do that, but what about the people who are making smaller products, like thermostats that interface with the net, et cetera? So my question is, how can we better get the word out to those companies, because we all know that the product development cycle goes crazy to try to get the competitive edge over the guy next door. How do we go about doing that and managing the result? Thank you for your time. This is the last question. I'm going to broaden it slightly, which is, you know, the question of what should we be doing now? What are you doing now to help companies of the Internet of Things be protected? But secondly, touch on that encryption issue. So <clears throat> first on the Internet of Things, and you bring out a, a great point, uh, the difference between what an IBM can do and what people who make, you know, your camera systems or other things around the house or printers and all these things. And the reality is each of those can have damaging effects, can be used as a cyber weapon. In fact, against the Eastern Seaboard, that big distributed denial of service attack was principally done by cameras and printers being pushed to go do this. Not my cameras, I think. I think I have mine protected. But, so the issue that you get to is exactly right. And most of those are made overseas. So how do we put together a standard that says you've got to meet these basic standards? That's actually one of the things that we, we addressed in the Presidential Commission. You've got to come up with a way of standardizing how you build that and build that in, like the good housekeeping seal of approval for cyber events. The hard part is some of these small companies who are overseas don't necessarily comport with U.S. law. So this is something that we will have to address, and I think that's the way to do it. Now, encryption. Encryption is, has some good and bad parts to it. I think overall, encryption is great for protecting our communications and doing all that. The bad part is that, let's say, my computer is infected, and now I send out encrypted email, and I infect your system. The cybersecurity things, can they see the encrypted data and do you have a decryption capability on the boundary to ensure that infected stuff doesn't get there? And if you don't, then you're creating a different vector for malware to get in your system. So we've got to address both. I think on the encryption, the overall, go ahead. 
you're going to. No, no, no. So I think as, as I look at it, and I'm looking at these, the SSL, what we see for a secure socket layer and how we're encrypting Gmail and all these things, I think it's good. But it's not sufficient. There's more that has to be done. And those that wish us harm are going to use this like a weapons platform. And we've got to step back and think about this as a weapons platform and how we defend it. And we can do that. And, you know, I think one of the, the, the great things is, you know, and this is the part about working with all these brilliant people at NSA and else, you know, we're really lucky we got those folks on our side because they'll come up with solutions like this. And should American companies like this one uh, allow you and cooperate with you uh, to make sure that their encryption doesn't impede what the NSA does? Well, I, I am not a proponent for a back door up front. I want a front door. And in the front door, it should be with the court. And, and through the court, just like we do anything, is to say, Here's what we want to do and why we want to do it. Get the court, Congress, and the administration to agree and tell the American people. I'm good with that. It's not, I don't think NSA wants to sneak around. Actually, if you think about it, NSA was asked to do this mission because NSA was the only agency that could do it. And it was to connect the dots and then give it to the FBI to defend this country. And it's the right thing to do. You know, and people might uh, look at NSA bad, but, you know, my comment to our people, we're doing the right thing, we're protecting this nation, and we have and we know it's legally the right thing to do. Thank you for being with us, and thank you for your service, General.